I have got to send a picture of this thing to my old boss. Check it out. The NCIX sign PC is off the sorry piece of cardboard and on the wall. And guys, look at this thing. I mean, what a way to celebrate those formative years of my career at the computer store. And it's even super fast. Hey, keep it down. Future Linus. If you ever want to get that thing, we got a lot of work to do over here. Justin did a great job with this MDF backboard. <laughs> Fun fact, uh, he couldn't just use an NCIX logo to design it since their signs and graphical assets were all slightly different from each other. So it had to be painstakingly custom modeled and cut. But now that the paint's dry, we are ready for final assembly. Oh my God, this looks awesome. Awesome, like our sponsor. War Thunder. War Thunder is an action-packed and detail-packed vehicle combat game. You gotta have both. You can play free right now on PC and consoles at the link below. Since we started this project, basically everything about it has changed, starting with the motherboard. We've gone with the B650i Aorus Ultra from Gigabyte. It might lack some of the nice-to-haves, like the abundance of ports and PCIe lanes that you'd find with X670, but it features 20 gig USB and CPU overclocking, which the A620 lacks. This particular board also supports PCIe Gen 5, which is an optional feature of the chipset, and uses 2.5 gig onboard networking, which is slower than what we used to use for our workstations, but that was back when we were shooting at 8K. This should be enough for our modern 4K workflow, and if it's not, these handy M.2 network cards are a great way to add 10 gig to an ITX board. Then for our CPU, we went with the Ryzen 7 7800X3D. It might lag behind the 13700K or even the 7700X for non-gaming tasks, but it's still a wicked fast eight core CPU and it's very power efficient thanks to its lower rated TDP, which is critical for a small form factor build, which, okay, it's kind of a large computer, but it's gonna be in a confined space and that's gonna matter. Also, we have about eight of these left over from the recent video where we bought a whack of them to evaluate the variation in performance from chip to chip. Um, so I grabbed one. <laughs> By the way, that's a super cool video and you're gonna wanna check it out. On the subject of cool, figuring out how to cool this machine was a big challenge. We wanted all the major components mounted inside the letters. Otherwise, how is it even a sign PC? It would just be a PC next to a sign. But we also wanted the finished install to be as clean as possible. So no gaping holes in the sides of our letters for intake fans. So we settled on a two-pronged approach, water cooling and hope. Water to carry away most of the heat from the major components like the CPU and the GPU, and then faith along with some teeny tiny fans to remove the rest. Not a huge fan of the mounting on these velocity squared blocks, but you can't fault the look. Man, are they sexy. For storage, while this motherboard does support PCIe Gen 5 drives, which theoretically are double the speed of Gen 4, in practice, that offers no perceivable benefit for daily use, so I settled on a crucial P5 Plus. Since all I need is a decent drive, I don't even really need a DRAM cache, that isn't going to immediately die. Almost everything that I work on is gonna be stored in the cloud or on one of our servers, which is why networking speed is much more important to me than the speed of my SSD. Another area where speed matters is memory. And we've gone with this Manta X Prism DDR5 6400 CL32 kit. 6,000 to 6,400 mega transfers per second is still the sweet spot for AMD when it comes to price to performance. And this kit is in that range. I don't know much else about it. Hopefully it works. <laughs> Time to mount this boy and how would I describe this build so far? Exquisite, exceptional, extraordinary, but unless I plan on running an iGPU, I still have more items to install, perhaps in the next letter over. The width of this letter was a big challenge for us to overcome when we went looking for a GPU. Even with water cooling, most modern cards are so tall that they won't fit in here once you account for the foam for the mounting, even before you factor in that most GPU water blocks have the fittings attaching up here. So we needed something where the fittings go on the back. 
Now, as a business machine for business, this GPU isn't gonna be doing a ton of heavy lifting, but we needed to be able to handle playback of raw 4K footage without issue, high quality screen capture, and I do occasionally fire up a game or two just in case I need to you know, quickly check something out for business reasons, of course. So we settled on this NVIDIA RTX 3070 collab card between ASUS and EK Waterblocks. Now let's see, where should we put the power supply? You see where I'm going with this, right? Our original plan was to use a Silverstone SFX power supply that we had full length cables for, but unfortunately during a test build that ended up exploding in a most underwhelming way, which probably had nothing to do with the amount of metal shavings around the workshop. Thankfully, we had other options and this white unit from Cooler Master actually might help us reflect more light from the RGB strips that we're gonna be putting in later as well. It's a bit of a change from the Seasonic Focus PX850s that we usually use in our workstations, but it's a suitable SFX alternative and with the correct number of washers should install just fine. If you plan on getting one of these, by the way, keep an eye out for the badge on the front of the box that says 100% Japanese capacitors. Version one lacks that badge, but more importantly, lacks proper fan control and can get kind of loud. Thankfully for us, we've got the Nipponsai Ichiban version and we can attach it to our backplate with the screws I showed you before and actually this cool 3D printed mount that I didn't show you before, but if you wanna check it out more closely, we're gonna have it linked down below if you ever need to mount a power supply to a backplate for some reason. Finally, we need the place to put the remainder of our liquid cooling parts. Okay, that one was not very good. Realistically, we could have gone for any size of EK's Quantum Kinetic Flat D5. So we went with the 240 millimeter version. It comes with a reliable D5 pump and gives us lots of room to route tubing. First to our radiator here on the other side. Speaking of, before we put this in, we went with the EK Quantum Surface S360. It uses copper fins and a balanced fin density for solid performance regardless of your fan speed, which matters a lot more to us than usual because even though these Noctuas spin at a decent speed, they are low profile fans, so they have lower static pressure than usual. And we wanted to use these to accommodate the fact that the N letter is gonna be sitting right over top of it. And where is the intake for okay. these, so or rather the exhaust? We're gonna do something a little bit different on this one, uh -huh. just because of the lack of space constraint here. Uh, we're actually gonna take one of these fans and we're gonna use it as an exhaust instead of having it all intake. Oh, I see, okay. That is an option. Another option would be to just put some speed holes in here as well, and then just have it passively exhaust out the rest of the end. Can we do the speed holes? Recirculating the air that you just heated up, not that effective. Man, this is looking awesome. Also, Tanner, did you realize how big this thing was? This is gonna take up the whole wall in my office. Yeah, it's going to take up the whole wall like it would at the front of a store. Right. Which makes perfect sense. Yes. Here, if you want a smaller NCIX sign, here, take that. Where'd you get this? The bottle opener flashlight keychain combo unit. I got it from NCIX. Are we about to make a fire? And I know, I know, soft line, yuck, right? But come on guys, it's a lot easier to work with. We're not gonna see the thing anyway, and it gives us a great excuse to show you guys our magnetic cable management clamps that are coming very soon, lttstore.com. I think that's it, and if we were smart, especially because this is made out of MDF, which gets completely destroyed by water, we would check to see if it leaks before we go ahead and fire it up properly. So I think we can, Fill it up, what is this? Canadian water cooling fluid? Comes in a bag now? Yes, sir. Like our milk? Yep. Sure. <laughs> hey, there we go. There we go. That's more like now it. Now we're moving some water. This seems like a good time to talk about our RGB fan controller here. Oh, but before we put that on, I should talk about our PCIe risers. We could have used a single Gen 4 600 millimeter riser, but you noticed, Instead, we used a 600 millimeter and then we used another 
100 millimeter one. What the heck is up with that? The problem is that we couldn't find a single riser at that length that had a right angle connector on it, and we really needed a right angle connector. So we had to use an extension. That means it might run at PCIe Gen 3 speeds, but with this generation of GPUs, that's not gonna affect performance anyway, so... Hey, <laughs> riser connector, no problem, we hope. Come to think of it, there's no reason to stay under there while I talk about the RGB lighting. We can just talk about it here and then put it down thereafter. Each of our letters already has some addressable RGB strips going all around the outside. You know, nothing fancy, just a casual 10 meters of RGB lighting. And then each letter plugs into the next one using these cool JST SM connectors, or as I like to call them, nice clippies. You'll sometimes find these on larger string lights and unlike, okay, that looks amazing, sorry. Um, unlike those awful standard RGB header connectors that plug into your motherboard, these things do a fantastic job of staying attached. The only reason that we subbed out Corsair's own RGB strips was because we wanted something that we could a little bit more easily cut and then route as needed. This did present some challenges, um, we're using our Commander Pro to handle the logic, but these lights are a mishmash of the RGB and ARGB standards, so they're three pins, like ARGB, voltage, data, and ground, but instead of the usual five volt power, it's got classic old RGB's 12 volt requirement. Um, this is for good reason, because it helps with efficiency and getting more consistent brightness out of the first and last LEDs in the strip, but it means we can only use the data lines from our commander and we need to draw 12 volt power from somewhere. Oh, so we just used a Molex connector, which is probably the same. What's the power draw on these? 1.5 amps. 1.5 amps. That'll be fine, just fine. We're not ready to put these on, are we? Are we done? We should probably do a test boot and make sure everything actually functions. I see. Other than that, it looks like everything is pretty much ready to go. It was all just a setup. Yeah. For the joke. It's, yeah, yes, we should do a quick test boot. It's, we gotta hook up the fans too. I see how we're gonna hook everything up for our test boot here, but have we given any thought to IO for yes, this all bad the, boy? Yes, all the IO is external. It's all external? Yes. Oh, like with a hub or something. Yeah, you're gonna have one of these. Ah, yes, okay. Thanks for our sponsor, Ugreen, who didn't sponsor this video, but they do sponsor things occasionally. Uh, Power button. Your keys right now. Oh, good. There, there will be one. There will be one. <laughs> we'll get it figured out. We got oh. letters. Is the pump running though? Oh wow, yeah, no, it just has all the bubbles out of it. Wow, fantastic. Oh, hey! Oh. Nice. Oh, that's good to see. Yes. Yay. All right, how about Expo? It's really big. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, this is a good opportunity for you guys to check out the back. We cable managed some stuff. Here, Justin, we can put it down for a sec. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's heavy. This is also my first look at how we're handling cable management. Networking is gonna be coming out of here. Neat, neat. Uh, where'd that USB-C connector go? Oh, look at that, it's right there. Yeah. Oh, cool. And if you look, we've used this gap, which is about three inches off the wall, not just for bottom mounted IO, but also to have some room for our intake fans. Wow, this is not gonna be easy. No. Um, it's really heavy. Yes. Speaking of heavy, you guys probably noticed these handy dandy handles. That's how we're gonna mount it. We're gonna lift up the ceiling tile and then we're gonna hang it over this partition here. The original plan had been to screw it into the wall, but what we realized is these modular panels are just a piece of sheet metal, some kind of something in between, basically air, and another piece of sheet metal. So if we just drilled into this, it would either sag or <laughs> completely come out and come crashing down onto my desk. We did come up with one idea where we had a backing on the other side and we screwed all the way through into that, but I was told that's not aesthetically pleasing. What's that brick? That's your power button, it sits on your desk. I see. I tried to get one of those like remote clicker ones, but we don't have any PCI slots. 
I feel like maybe I should have specified what I had intended with the power button, but you know what? We're doing great. No, Colin, you know what? That's, that's a really good idea, but can we try it this way first? Justin, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Okay, I've got this, Colin. If you want to help him, that's probably better. Okay, all right. So that's on, and now I am stuck. Yes. Um, wait, wait, wait. Hold on, don't lift it yet. Ah! Ah! Nice! That is freaking awesome! All right. Oh yeah, I told, man, I didn't need the cable ties at all. Kind of clean. Uh, okay, let's, uh... Oh, good thing that didn't break. My Cleveland Browns lava lamp. Did I just say lamp? Big moment. <laughs> that looks so freaking awesome! No way! Oh! Hey! Oh, really, you guys? It was like that when I got... got it. Uh-huh. <laughs> Keep changes, nice. You know what, screw it, we're turning HDR on. Oh good, it looks, forget it. Let's not turn HDR on for office work. <laughs> what we do wanna know even for office work though is whether our cooling system works. It's quiet, but does it perform? To find out, I'll be running a stress test on both the GPU and CPU for 30 minutes to see if it can handle the heat. All right, we've been benchmarking this for a little while now and the GPU looks like it's good, but the CPU is running mighty hot. And that is very confusing until you take the X off and look at this block. You might not be able to see it right away, but some of you might be more eagle-eyed and notice that this edge is much farther off than this edge to the motherboard. Uh, if you look at it through the thermal camera, this thing is just shooting off heat and boy, you can, really kind of feel it over here. It's uh, it's not a happy camper. Our GPU is fine though. And that, my friends, is why we run stress tests. It turned out that the fans on the radiator were hooked up to the Commander Pro, which was not getting an input from the CPU for its temperatures. So the fans were staying running at minimum RPM. And after about 15 minutes, we thermal throttled, going from about 80 watts of power consumption on the CPU to just 30. Fortunately, fixing it was as simple as getting those fans plugged into the PWM header that is on the motherboard itself. And we're back up to 78 watts, which, okay, it's still a little on the warm side. In a perfect world, I might throw full thick fans on there instead of the low profile ones, but I will never be running such a long load on this system. And I think I'm just gonna leave it alone unless I were to upgrade the rest of the system, like even putting in a more powerful GPU could dump more heat into the loop. Then we'd need to take another look at the cooling. But that's a problem for the future. A future where you'll already know about our sponsor. War Thunder. What could be more satisfying than watching huge vehicles get blown up in a video game? Well, the obvious answer is watching over 2,000 vehicles get blown up. It's simple math. War Thunder is a free-to-play PvP with a focus on realism. The combat is immersive. Every tank, plane, and ship is modeled after their real counterparts, right down to how it feels to pilot them and the sounds they make. There's a game mode for everyone, from the casual to the most hardcore players. One of the cooler features is the damage x-ray view. Whenever you destroy an enemy vehicle, you can see where the damage was done, how it affected the vehicle, and what ultimately led to your victory. And that makes strategizing for next time all the easier. So join over 70 million players from around the world and start playing War Thunder free today at the link below. If you guys enjoyed this video, why not check out part one where we laid out the plan and it didn't go quite as smoothly as this. <laughs>